the 2021 Kinder Institute Lunch Out. Please welcome the director of Rice University's Kinder Institute for Urban Research, Bill Fulton. Good afternoon or good morning or even good evening, depending on where you are. I'm Bill Fulton, director of Rice University's Kinder Institute for Urban Research, and I am glad to have you with us. We are coming to you virtually from the Rice campus, just as we did for the 2020 Lunch Out. One of the things we learned from last year's event was while our work is deeply rooted here in Houston, our reach is global. Over 3,000 people joined us from around the world last year. Now, what can we say about the last 14 months that hasn't been said before? It's been an unusual year, and today's program will provide some insights into just how unusual it's been. Of course, our hearts go out to all the people around the world who have weathered the global health crisis, especially those on the front lines, like our health partner, Memorial Hermann. As they've done for more than a century, Memorial Hermann has cared for Houstonians this past year through the pandemic, planning and delivering care to ensure the health of our great city. Their leadership has reminded all of us what we are capable of when we work together. We count on them to care for us, our neighbors, our colleagues, and our friends. And the Kinder Institute is grateful for their support and unwavering dedication to improving the health of our community. Many of you joined us for the 2020 Lunch Out, and this year we have an exciting new format. For sure, you'll get to hear Steve Kleinberg remark on the 2021 Kinder Houston Area Survey, which has followed the striking transformations of Houston over the past 40 years. But there's much more. Steve will be joined by one of our newest teammates, Robert Bozick. Dr. Bozick will help us propel the annual survey into the future, hopefully 40 years more and beyond. And through the prism of the 2021 annual survey, you'll learn about what the Institute and Rice are doing on the issues that matter most to Houstonians. The director of our Houston Education Research Consortium, Ruth Lopez Turley, will discuss her big role in transforming education. Our colleague Jennifer Bradder, a Kinder Fellow and an extraordinary professor of sociology, will talk about leading efforts around issues of inequality and equity. And a bit later, I'll rejoin you and share some thoughts about the future of life in Houston after COVID-19. Perhaps the most exciting change this year is giving you the opportunity to further engage with Steve Kleinberg and other Rice leaders. Below on your screen, you'll see links to separate Zoom rooms on education, equity, and the future of Houston after COVID-19. As you watch the program, think about what issues stand out to you and then join the room of your choice after the lunch out. One thing we love doing every year, which is not new, is honoring a remarkable Houstonian with the Stephen L. Kleinberg Award. This year, the awardee is Bob Urey, longtime president of Central Houston. I have long been astonished by Bob's reputation, not just here in Houston, but around the nation. For decades, he has been acknowledged as a leader by his peers from Atlanta to San Diego. As a Rice Architecture alum and former head of the Rice Center, he was one of our founding board members at the Kinder Institute and has helped us blaze a trail to make our work possible. Now, as we begin to emerge from the pandemic and look to the future, you can expect the Kinder Institute to play an important role. In fact, we tend to stay pretty busy during unusual times. Next month on June 22nd, we'll release our second State of Housing Report, which provides much needed, clear, and accessible information about housing for all Houstonians each year. We stayed on top of the COVID crisis in various ways, ranging from our analysis of job losses associated with the pandemic to our ongoing blog series about the impact of COVID on cities 
and we've pivoted toward police reform last fall when our report on citizen oversight of policing was released in order to help inform reform efforts here in Houston. And our data tools, the Urban Data Platform and Houston Community Data Connections, which we call the UDP and HCDC, will continue to leverage significant investments in data to great advantage for researchers, residents, and our business and nonprofit partners. Let me close by saying that the entire Kinder Institute team is grateful to those of you who have supported this year's event, especially our presenting sponsors, Kinder Foundation and Bracewell. Let's have a brief look at the companies, individuals, and others whose leadership has made today's lunch out possible. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for watching the 2021 Kinder Institute Lunch Out. The generosity of our sponsors has made this year's event possible. Please join us as we share our sincere thanks. Our 2021 Lunch Out presenting sponsors, Kinder Foundation and Bracewell LLP. We thank our underwriters. 2021 Kinder Houston Area Survey Print Underwriter, Bank of America. 2020 Annual Report Underwriter, Centerpoint Energy. Lunch Out Social Media Underwriter, Chevron. Lunch Out Print Program Underwriter, CKP. Breakout Room Underwriter, PNC Bank. Our 2021 Health Partner, Memorial Hermann. Visionary Circle. Laura and Tom Bacon, Gail and Bob Urey, Patty and Richard Everett, Exxon Mobil, Sarah and Doug Fauché, The Hanover Company, HEB, Sis and Hasty Johnson, Melissa and Steve Kane, Fung and George Levon, John L. Now III, Silver Eagle Beverages, San Antonio, Regina Rogers, Susan and Fayez Serafin, Phoebe and Bobby Tudor, and the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. We'd like to recognize our Leadership Circle sponsors. Special thanks to our production partner, Vision, and our media partner, Houston Public Media. The Kinder Institute and Rice University deeply appreciate our elected officials and civic leaders who continue to make Houston a great city, especially in challenging times. Our thanks to all of our sponsors and to all of Houston's great leaders. Before I turn it over, I want to again point you to the bottom of your screen, where, in addition to the post-event links, you will find links to this year's Kinder Houston Area Survey, our 2020 Annual Report, and today's e-program. You can download and read these at your convenience. And our sincere thanks to Bank of America, Centerpoint Energy, and CKP for making it possible for us to provide these resources to you. And if you're into social media, join the conversation online by using the hashtag HoustonSurvey. Thanks for joining us today, and now I'm delighted to welcome David Lebron, President of Rice University. Thank you, Bill, and greetings to you all from Rice University. Each year before last year, I had the extraordinary honor to speak to a packed room of Houstonians at the Kinder Institute Annual Luncheon, where we would hear the latest from our very own Steve Kleinberg and his annual Kinder Houston Area Survey. I look forward to the day, hopefully very soon, when we can do that once again. For now, I am delighted to be with you online, allowing residents of Houston and those from around the world to join us and learn all about our extraordinary city. In a moment, it will be my privilege to welcome Steve Kleinberg and others from the Kinder Institute to talk with you about important issues affecting our city. Understanding and addressing these issues are indeed vital to our city's future success. But the knowledge produced by the Kinder Institute also has implications for urban areas all across our country. As Dr. Kleinberg so often reminds us, so goes Houston, so goes America. Last year at this lunch out event, we celebrated the Institute's 10th anniversary. Its success over its first decade has indeed been remarkable. And this year we have another anniversary, 
the 40th edition of the Kinder Houston Area Survey. Dr. Kleinberg and his students were undertaking this foundational work for decades before the Institute itself was created. In many ways, the survey was the cornerstone of the Kinder Institute, but it did take time and the generosity of the Kinders to construct an edifice that would support the broader mission of today. Now the survey, and in fact, all the work of the Institute across a wide array of topics play a central role in enabling Rice to support and contribute to the growth of Houston. The Kinder Institute is key to our strategies of empowering the success of Houston and producing knowledge that leads to better cities everywhere. The Institute's efforts have confirmed that Houston is one of, if not the most diverse metro regions in the country. To that end, I am also proud that all of Rice University increasingly reflects the diversity of our city, our nation, and our world. Focused efforts on diversity, equity, and inclusion have significantly increased over the past two years at Rice. We established the Task Force on Slavery, Segregation, and Racial Injustice. The preliminary report from this task force and its two co-chairs will be out later this spring. We appointed a new vice provost for diversity, equity, and inclusion, Professor Alex Byrd. We hired our first scholar in residence for racial justice, the acclaimed writer, Brian Washington. We are requiring diversity training for all faculty and staff. And we have approved courses on diversity and cultural understanding for our general education requirement. Also, we have made notable progress in continuing to increase diversity among our students, faculty, and staff. Making our city and nation more equitable and inclusive is work that we must all contribute to. Our current strategic plan calls for our university to engage with and help empower the success of the city of Houston. The Kinder Institute for Urban Research at Rice University is a true exemplar in the fulfillment of this mission. It has become, as it was envisioned, the center of policy research in Houston and a go-to resource for our city for policy expertise on critical urban issues, especially over this past year when the entire world was figuring out how to respond to the challenges of the COVID pandemic. The Institute continued to do the work that was more vital than ever, collecting data, doing research, and leading conversations to keep our city safe and thriving. We at Rice, and I personally, are very proud that the Kinder Institute is part of our university and a key element of our engagement with our home city. I am very pleased to now introduce to you the Institute's founding director, Steve Kleinberg, as he begins sharing the findings from this year's 40th Kinder Houston Area Survey. And I am excited also for you to meet Robert Bozick, a bright new member of the Institute team who will help bring this pivotal research into the next decades and beyond. Thank you all again for being with us today. Please be safe, take care, and get vaccinated as soon as you are able. Well, thank you all so much for, for being here. We look forward to, to this opportunity to share with you what we've learned from this latest, the 40th of the annual surveys, and, and uh, look forward next year to all of us being together instead of this sort of strange world of, of, of uh, Zooming and, and uh, remote, remote connections. But, it's wonderful that, you're, that you've been able to join us. And it's a great chance for me to introduce to everybody my good friend and extraordinary colleague, Robert Bozick, who's joined me, and together we're going to expand even further the, the value of the surveys. Robert, welcome to Houston. <laughs> Thanks so much, Steve. I, it is an honor to be here with all of you. I just started here at the Kinder Institute, and I'm going to be working alongside Stephen Kleinberg as the Associate Director of the Kinder Houston Area Survey. And it is a true honor to be in the presence of greatness, uh, to be able to work alongside Stephen on this remarkable survey. Stephen has developed, as you all know, a incredible body of research using 40 years of data to track large-scale demographic changes in this city. And I look forward to carrying the mantle from Steve and pushing forward this remarkable survey into the next 40 years. Uh, this year in particular has been an interesting year to start at the Kinder Institute. As you're all aware, we've been going through some unusual changes in American society, and the Kinder Houston Area Survey is very well positioned to understand and to, to convey some of these changes, particularly as they affect the city of Houston. 
Uh, Steve, what are we learning in this year's survey? So the two great themes, of course, number one is the one we've been doing every year, an, an extraordinary picture of a city undergoing rethinking, reimagining what it is in the, tw in the 21st century, how to position Houston for prosperity in the 21st century. And then this remarkable moment. This, we did the last interviews for the, tw for the 2020 survey on March 12th. And on March 16th, the pandemic hit. And for a year, growing health pandemic and economic shutdown and growing awareness of racial injustice and, and inequalities, how have ordinary Houstonians been affected? by the year-long experience. And that's the other big theme that we'll be touching on in our discussion today. So it's a, it has been a really fascinating year and a, and a fascinating additional picture of a city reimagining itself in the 21st century. Indeed, I think we've, we've learned a lot and we still have a lot to learn. So without any further ado, here are the findings from this year's survey. Okay, great guys. Well, delighted of course to be here. And in this, we wanna make our, in this report to you, on, on the 40th year of the Kinder Houston Air Survey, we're exploring, as we mentioned, two central issues, right? How have Houstonians changed over these 40 years in, in critical ways that indicate some of the opportunities we have to act differently as a community than five or 10 or 20 years ago? What are the most consequential shifts in attitudes and perceptions? And what are the implications of those shifts for public policy going forward? And then, of course, we did the last interviews last year on March 12th of 2020, Four days later, the, the deadly year-long health pandemic hit Houston along with the economic shutdown, the collapse of oil prices. Three months later, by the death of George Floyd and the deepening concerns about systemic racism and growing inequalities. So the second question is, in what specific ways have Harris County residents been personally impacted by the events of this remarkable year? So here's a reminder of those, of those 40 years. This is asking a representative random sample of Harris County residents, starting with our first survey in March of 1982, when Houston was booming. We asked people, how would you rate job opportunities in Houston? Excellent, good, fair, or poor? 71% were saying job opportunities were excellent or good. Two months later, in May of 1982, the oil boom collapsed. A city that had, had 80 years of riding the oil boom to continued prosperity. Suddenly the price of oil dropped, it had gone up to 38%. We were building and borrowing on the basis of $50 oil, fell down to 28% by the end of 1983, and 100,000 jobs were lost. There was a slight recovery in 84. The saying in Houston was, stay alive till 85. Just a slight adaptation in the oil business. Houston will boom again, and then the wheel hit. The falling price of Texas oil kept falling, fell below $10 a barrel in late 1986, early 87. One out of every seven jobs that had been in Houston in 1982 disappeared. In the worst regional recession of any part of the country at any time since World War II in a city that had known nothing but economic boom from its beginnings. And then we watched this much more problematic economy with booms and busts moving back and forth. And then the last six years, there's been a steady high level of positive ratings of job opportunities until this year, when again, a slight but significant decline occurred in the percent giving positive ratings to job opportunities. Nice indication of what may be coming. It's, it was a slight decline, not a collapse in a way that indicates that we may be coming out of this pandemic in, in, in short order. Here's another set of questions we've asked over all these years. How, how have you been doing financially in the last couple of years? Things have been getting better about the same or worse? And how do you think you'll be three or four years into the future? And you can see this dramatic, significant drop in the percent saying, I've been doing better in the last few years, uh, but no drop whatsoever in the percent saying, uh, I expect to be doing better. I expect to be better off in the next th uh, three or four years. Uh, and, and that optimism remains powerful and real and is a part of the story of Houston over all its years and a big part of the story today. We're coming out of a recession, out of a, of a health pandemic, and the future looks much brighter than it did seven or eight months ago. Uh, and then, but, but here is a reminder of the deep inequalities in Houston. A series of questions that just measure the, the distribution of hardship in the city. Houston, we asked people uh, two years ago or, or this year, uh, suppose you had to come up with $400 to meet an emergency expense. How would you deal with that situation? Would you? Pay for it out of savings, would you need to borrow it, or would you not be able to come up with $400 to meet an emergency expense? And 40, more than 40% of African Americans and Latinos who participated in the survey in, in Harris County this year, more than 40% said they could not come up with $400. Living on the edge 
compared to just 13% of Anglos and 7% of Asians. We have the greatest medical complex in the world in the Texas Medical Center, and Houston has the highest percentage of children without health insurance of any major city in America, and especially Hispanics, so many of whom are, are working as, as in low-wage jobs as, as immigrants into the city, rep report that they have no health insurance. Uh, percent making household, having, living on household incomes of less than 37,000 was about 40% overall. 45% said they had problems paying for housing during the past year. Powerful reminder that we'll come back to as we think about the future of the city, of, of the deepening inequalities, particularly in the experiences of African Americans and Latinos in this city that, that uh, you know, is doing so well in so many other particular and important ways. Uh, here's why this matters so much. This is the demographic changes in, in, in Houston, Harris County during all the decades since 1960. In 1960, there were 1.243 million of us living in Harris County, Texas. This was our biracial world. 74% of us were Anglos, 20% African Americans, 6% Hispanics, less than one half of 1% were Asians. We were a biracial southern city dominated and controlled in an automatic, taken for granted way by white men. And during the oil boom years of the 60s and 70s, it was Anglos pouring into Houston from everywhere else in the country. This is where the jobs were. By 1980, Houston became the fourth largest city in America, still an overwhelmingly Anglo city. Two years later, in 1982, the oil boom collapsed. The Anglo population stopped growing and then declined. The Af African American population it was kept pace with the population as a whole, fueled by African immigration, fueled by the great remigration of middle-class African Americans coming back from northern cities to southern cities, Atlanta first, Houston second. African American population keeping pace, surging populations of Latinos and Asians. And by the latest census estimates, we'll get the real figures coming soon, Harris County is 42% Hispanic, 31% Anglo, 19% African American, 8.5% Asian. No city has been transformed so rapidly. This is the story of Houston. Houston is where all of America is gonna be as the 21st century unfolds. This, this, this demographic transformation and the critical importance of investing in the opportunities for African-Americans and Latinos is palpably important when you think about and just look at the transformations. And it's not just numbers, it's also ages. So this brings me to the other demographics. Let's see, I've got babies on the left and old people on the right. I've got 12 different age categories from under the age of five to 70 years old or older. And here across Harris County is where the Anglos are in Harris County, Texas today. Ladies and gentlemen, the baby boom. It's not till you reach people age 63 and older that the majority of folks in Harris County, Texas are Anglos. And at each younger age group, the percentage of Anglos plummets percentage of African Americans, Latinos, and Asians surges. Here's where everybody else is in Houston, Texas today. Wow, a powerful picture of Houston's present and future of everybody in Harris County, Texas, under the age of 20, who will be the workers and citizens and voters and taxpayers of Houston in the 21st century, of everybody across Harris County, under the age of 20, 51% are Latinos, 19% are African Americans, 9% are Asians, 21% of everybody under 20 is Anglo. So two big points to make. It is a safe statement to make that if Houston's African-American, Latino, young people, 70% of every, all young people are African-American, Latino, if those folks are not prepared to succeed in the global knowledge economy of the 21st century, it is difficult to envision a prosperous future for Houston. And the other point to make is that this is a done deal. Close the borders, build your fence, no force in the world is going to stop Houston or Texas or America from becoming more African-American, more Asian, more Latino, and less Anglo as the 21st century unfolds. And the story of Houston is that we are there first. By 2050, all of America will look like Houston looks today. This is where the American future is going to be worked out. And it's the centerpiece of, of the challenge and opportunities that Houston faces as the most ethnically diverse major metropolitan area in the entire country, and coming to grips maybe a little bit ahead of the rest of the country with the central challenges of ensuring, making the investments in education and support systems that enable young people to succeed in the knowledge economy of the, of the 21st century. Uh, if the city is going to flourish in the years ahead, it needs to grow into a much more unified, equitable and inclusive, multi-ethnic society positioned to capitalize fully 
on the remarkable ethnic and cultural diversity that is the story of Houston in the 21st century. Anise Parker, soon after she had left the, being mayor of the city, was asked, what surprised you the most? And she said something to the effect that what was striking is that every language of business spoken anywhere in the world is spoken in Houston by native speakers with global connections. This diversity can be the greatest asset that Houston could have as it positions itself in the global economy. Younger generations in all ethnic communities are embracing the diversity that older generations still find a little bit more difficult to accept, but you can see this happening across the board as we embrace the diversity. And the great question is, will this city be able to reverse the trajectory of the past 40 years of deepening economic disparities and make meaningful and sustained progress toward reducing the racial and ethnic divides in income and wealth and achieving substantially greater equality of opportunity across the board? It is the centerpiece of the question of Houston's future. Can we collectively make those investments to ensure Houston's prosperity as the 21st century unfolds? Uh, and so now I'm happy to pass the speaker's gavel to Robert Bozik, who's the associate director, as you know, of the Kinder Houston Area Survey. He will review this year's findings and some of the ways in which Harris County residents have been personally impacted by the year-long health pandemic, the economic shutdown, concerns about systemic racism, and the growing inequalities. And then I'll come back and, and touch on a few of the other central transformations we've been watching over the years as Houston repositions itself for prosperity in the new world of the 21st century. Thank you, Steve. With a once-in-a-lifetime global pandemic unfolding in real time, we had the opportunity with this year's Kinder Houston Area Survey to ask Houston residents about how COVID-19 directly affected their lives. More than 60% of survey respondents reported that they personally knew someone who had been hospitalized or had died as a result of having COVID-19. Another 60% said they were feeling more stressed these days when compared to a year ago, and about half reported feeling depressed or anxious in the past year. Additionally, about 14% turned to government assistance to help them through these tough times. The pervasive stress of the pandemic was by and large equally distributed across all racial and ethnic groups in the city, but Black and Hispanic Houstonians have been most immediately affected by the pandemic with higher rates of hospitalizations and death within those communities. In addition to the immediate health impacts, the COVID-19 pandemic upended whether and how we participate in the labor force. Shutdowns and social distancing policies forced many businesses to close or to radically alter their operations. When we asked survey respondents how the pandemic affected their work lives, we learned that it was particularly consequential for our Hispanic neighbors. Among Hispanic survey respondents, two-thirds had personally risked exposure to the virus so that they could keep their jobs. 28% had lost income in the past year, and nearly half worked fewer hours. These impediments to employment were higher for Hispanics than any other racial ethnic group. In future years, we will be able to assess whether the events of 2020 created a temporary economic setback for Houston's Hispanic community, or if it will result in even stronger barriers toward economic mobility moving forward. Given the threat of contracting the virus and the economic recession that resulted from efforts to mitigate the spread of the virus, unsurprisingly, there was an uptick in concerns about health and safety this past year. In terms of questions regarding health and safety, in 2021, we observed the highest rates on record among Houstonians in their fears of being the victim of a crime and the highest rates on record of Houstonians reporting being in only fair or poor health. Indeed, it appears the pandemic has broadly contributed to lowered perceptions of our own personal well-being. In addition to the pandemic, the past year was punctuated by the death of George Floyd at the hands of police and subsequent Black Lives Matter protests last summer, and more recently by a number of additional incidents which have brought discrimination and violence toward Asian Americans into focus. With many stuck at home due to the pandemic, these events have been able to capture the attention of Americans in a way that similar events in past years have not. Therefore, we sought to assess the changes in relationships among ethnic groups in the city and perceptions of discrimination. Over the years, we have asked Houston residents 
how they would rate the relationships among ethnic groups in the city. Here we show the percentage who rated the relationships as either good or excellent. Consistently over the years, whites have expressed the most favorable views, followed by Hispanics, with blacks holding the least favorable view. Focusing specifically on changes between 2020 and 2021, there was a pronounced drop in positive ratings for all racial ethnic groups, with the lowest favorable ratings on record observed for blacks. In 2021, only a quarter of blacks felt that racial ethnic relationships were either good or excellent, compared to about 45% of Hispanics and over half of whites. Next, we asked survey respondents whether or not they agreed with the statement, Black people in the United States are still a long way from having the same chance in life that white people have. Throughout the years in which this question was asked, a majority of Blacks have consistently reported that they agreed with this statement. This is not surprising, as Blacks experience discrimination and racial barriers more directly than other groups. However, we see that over time, white and Hispanic residents have gradually increased their likelihood of agreeing with this statement, with the sharpest increases occurring over the past year. By 2021, three quarters of whites and Hispanics in Houston felt that blacks are still a long way off from having the same life chances as whites. While we cannot unequivocally identify the reasons for this shift, we speculate that the death of George Floyd and the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement raised the consciousness of all Houstonians to a better understanding and more sensitivity toward the plight of, of Blacks in American society. Future surveys will help us understand whether this was a temporary swing in our collective concern with racial discrimination, or if this indeed represents a real long-term shift in public opinion. One of the focal points of the Black Lives Matter movement, which gained worldwide visibility last summer, is the criminal justice system. The movement has elevated calls for criminal justice reform. However, we know that such calls are unlikely to translate into concrete policy actions without sustained public support. To assess the trends in public support, we asked our survey respondents whether they thought the criminal justice system in Houston is biased against Blacks, biased in favor of Blacks, or does it generally give Blacks fair treatment? The perception of bias among the Black respondents increased from 71% in 1996, which was the first year we asked this question, to 85% this year, the highest number on record. Across the board, Blacks express a deep belief that they will not get a fair shake should they be accused of a crime. White and Hispanic Houstonians are far less likely to agree with this appraisal. In all years, the majority of whites and Hispanics reported that they felt the criminal justice system was not biased against Blacks. However, we did observe an increase in the past few years in the percentage of both whites and Hispanics who agreed that the criminal justice system is indeed biased against Blacks. Again, we speculate that this shift is likely due to the intense media coverage given to the death of George Floyd and the subsequent Black Lives Matter protests. In addition to feelings about ethnic group relations and criminal justice, we asked questions that directly probed personal experiences with discrimination. Over the years, we have asked survey respondents whether they were ever personally discriminated against because of their race or ethnicity while living in Houston. Blacks reported experiencing the most discrimination, followed by Hispanics and then whites. Over the years, the percentage of Blacks reporting personal experiences with discrimination grew from 39% in 2006 to 63% in 2021. In further probing specific instances of discrimination, we included two new questions this year. We asked survey respondents whether they had been unfairly stopped by the police and whether they felt that people were suspicious of them simply because of their race or ethnicity. We found that Blacks in Houston are substantially more likely than any other group to report being unfairly stopped by the police and to have felt that others were suspicious of them because of their race ethnicity. 
Although the differences are not as pronounced, it is worth noting that Asians and Hispanics in Houston report non-negligible experiences with discrimination and rates that are much higher than those reported by their white counterparts. In taking stock of the multiple ways that the events of last year have led to experiences with loss, diminished health and well-being, fears of crime, and concerns about long-standing inequalities, in what ways are Houstonians changing in their broader attitudes toward policy matters and in their calls on Houston's leaders to plot a new path forward? For that, I'll turn back to Steve. Thanks so much, Robert. That was a great presentation and a powerful reminder of this remarkable year that we've been undergoing together. Uh, I want to touch on a few of the broader transformations. What it really seemed to us to be consequential shifts in what the world contains, how people see the world today. So here's a series of questions about the role of government in a, in a, in a community where we've always believed that government is the problem, that free enterprise always has a better solution than government bureaucrats. Question that said, do you agree or disagree? Government has a responsibility to help reduce the inequalities between rich and poor in America. 85% today agree to that statement, up from 53% in 2013. We said, do you think most people who are poor today are poor because of circumstances they can't control or because they're not working hard enough? Percent saying circumstances they can't control went from 61 to 80%. Third indication in this chart was, do you think that government should do more to solve our country's problems or is government trying to do too many things that should be left to individuals and businesses. And the percent saying government needs to do more to solve our country's problems is 47% growing to 58%. People are poor in America today because of a whole range of shifts in the circumstances of people's lives. And we have a responsibility and indeed a, a, a personal interest in helping those folks succeed. One other example from last year, we said, uh, are the people who are receiving welfare benefits really in need of help or are they taking advantage of the system? The percentage said they're really in need of help increased from 45% to 68% during this same period. A new awareness, a new sensitivity to the role that government can and must play in, in social justice, in strengthening the safety net, in building a viable society for the 21st century. Uh, and then assessments of the new immigration, just looking at U.S.-born Anglos, not much change, variety, but staying up very high in favor of granting legal immigrants the path of legal citizenship. If they, if, if they speak English and have no criminal record, should we admit more of the same number or fewer immigrants in the next 10 years as we've been in the last 10? And then what about allowing children of undocumented immigrants to become U.S. citizens? It was a significant shift, already high at 76% to 88%. Just among Anglos, a growing support for, for the new immigration, for for the, the, the whole sense of the remarkable transformations that are underway in this city, this state, and this country as the 21st century unfolds. Uh, and one of the things that's striking is that the single most powerful predictor among Anglos of comfort with diversity and support for immigration is not education, it's not gender, it's age. Younger Anglos take for granted what older Anglos are still struggling to accept. Here's how we tested this. this is, of looking at just U.S. born Harris County Anglos when they were asked these questions when they were aged 25 to 35, comparing those who were born in the 1960s, the baby boom generation, those born in the 1970s, the Gen X, and those born in the 1980s, the beginnings of the millennial generation. Uh, uh, do you think the increasing immigration into this country today mostly strengthens American culture or mostly threatens American culture? Uh, do immigrants to the U.S. generally take more from the American econ economy they contribute, or do they contribute more than they take? And, which, and uh, should the U.S. admit more of the same number or fewer immigrants in the next 10 years than in the last 10? This is what sociologists call a robust finding. However you ask the question, younger Anglos are growing up in a world where they're, hey, taking this world for granted is what we love about America. This is who we are. This is Houston's destiny. That we older Anglos are still having some difficulty with. So I tell you, you got to be gentle with us old Anglos. But all of us are moving into this remarkable finding of a growing embrace of the diversity across the board in this city that just happens to be the most diverse city in all of America. Um, we've been tracking for the last four years, of course, consequences of, of Harvey. Uh, uh, one of the questions we asked was, uh, do you agree or disagree? It is virtually certain that Houston, the Houston area will experience more severe storms in the next 10 years as we experienced in the last 10, stayed up very high, dropped from 75% to 
to 59% in the survey this year of those thinking we're, it's, it's virtually certain that there'll be a, 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 major, a major storm. On the other hand, no change, in fact, a slight increase in the percent saying that they, they're in favor of prohibiting any additional construction in areas that have repeatedly flooded. A growing, again, recognition and willingness to see people that government and, and regulations need to be in place uh, in, in, to complement the private enterprise decisions that individuals make. And then really quite striking, uh, which of these statements come closest to your views? We need better land use planning to guide development in the Houston area, or individuals and businesses should be free to build wherever they want. We need better land use planning to guide development went from 67% in 2011 to 85% in the survey this year. A really quite striking and further confirmation of a willingness to see a, a, a positive role for government in building the city and helping us move in the, in the positive direction uh, during, during these, this remarkably complicated set of years that we're in the midst of. So one of the national trends has been the increasing secularization of, of Americans, the, the most religious society of all the industrial countries. We're watching that secularization happen in Houston as well. Here are just three examples of converging findings, right? We said, for example, uh, the first question was, are you Protestant, Catholic? What is your religious preference, if any? Is it Protestant, Catholic, Jewish, some other religion or no religion? And the percent saying no religion went from 8% in, in the early years when we were asking that question to 26% today. And then we said, how important is religion in your life? Would you say very important, somewhat important, or not very important? 10% to 22% today saying religion is not very important in my life. And then maybe even more striking, perhaps tied into the COVID experience, did you by any chance attend a religious service uh, at some point in the last 30 years There was not a wedding or a funeral? And 70% of everybody in Harris County said, no, they did not. 37% only in the early 2000s had not attended a religious ceremony. So we are becoming a more, more secular society. Attitudes are evolving in ways that go beyond what also is evolving, but much more slowly in the religious community. Classic example is gay rights that has just revolutionized our understanding of homosexuality is not something people choose. It's part of the natural human variation. Some of my best friends are gay and, and uh, support for gay Gays, uh, uh, marriages between homosexuals should be given the same legal status as heterosexual marriages, went from 33% to 70%. Percent who say, are you in favor of allowing gays, uh, uh, homosexual couples to legally adopt children was only 11% when we first asked that question, now 59%. So a, a growing sort of movement away from the traditional religious ideologies that are interesting and important to recognize and to ask, what are some alternative ways by which uh, we can reestablish re religion or encourage more participation. I'll leave that for another day. And then political party, are you Republican, Democrat, Independent, or something else? If they said something else, we said, do you think of yourself as closer to the Republican Party or the Democratic Party? Through all the early years of the surveys until 20, 2005, it was a 50-50 split. This was one of the interesting sort of mixed cities that, that were equally Republican and Democrat. Since then, pretty consistently with one sort of exception in 2012, 2013, Democrats have increased in their representation and Republicans have dropped. And today, a bigger gap than ever before of 20 percentage points, 45% of everybody in Harris County, Texas today are Democrats, 25% are Republicans. And, and that's been an interesting phenomenon in urban America, the, the, blue, the blue cities and the red countryside that is also very central to Texas. But we've been watching the Harris County population become more, to feel more comfortable with the Democratic Party than the Republican Party. So the, here's the last slide I wanted to show you. This is, this is uh, optimism and pessimism among Democrats and Republicans. When we asked the question, it said, do you, as, when you look ahead to the next few years, do you tend to believe that the country is headed for better times or more difficult times? And it's a reminder of how much the world is affected. Our perceptions of the world are affected by our preferences and beliefs about, about that world. When, when uh, Obama was in the White House, Democrats were much more optimistic than Republicans. The election of Trump, significant increase among uh, Republicans in their optimism, a, a radical decrease among Democrats. And now in this last election of Joe Biden, a drop of 60 percentage points, seven, from 50 percentage points, sorry, from 
before the election to 19% after, saying the country is headed for a better time if you're a Republican, and a significant increase from 38% to 58% among those saying that they, uh, that, that, uh, among the Democrats after the election of Joe Biden. A powerful reminder again of how, how much the, what the world contains is a mixture of what is actually out there and what we perceive and per, prefer to believe about the world. But it also reminds us of the deep partisan divide, how very different the world looks if you're a Republican or Democrat. And that also is a reminder of why it is so difficult and complicated and urgent to find common pathways forward to build the Houston and the America that is positioned for success in the 21st century. So let me conclude this with some of the sort of central summaries that we have of what these 40 years of surveys in Houston have shown us. Survey participants are increasingly prepared to assert the urgent need to make major improvements in the public schools. Spending uh, questions we asked last year, uh, which statements come closest to your feelings about the public schools? The schools have enough money, if it was used wisely, to provide a quality education, or the schools will need significantly more money to provide a quality education. A sea change from the 1990s when the clear majority said the schools have all the money they need to, to uh, 2018 and 2020 when overwhelmingly 59% to 30% saying the schools will need significantly more money. A new recognition, we need to spend more money to improve the public schools because that is the determinant of the opportunities in this global knowledge economy of the 21st century. Survey respondents recognize more clearly than ever before that most poor people are, in, are poor in America because of circumstances they can't control through no fault of their own. And they're calling significantly, increasingly for stronger programs to redress the rising inequalities, to strengthen the safety net, to build a more viable and sustainable society. They're embracing Houston's burgeoning diversity across the board, young, younger Anglos more than older Anglos, feeling more comfortable in a world of thriving friendships across ethnic communities, religious beliefs, and sexual orientations. And they support, as we saw, more stringent controls on development to mitigate future storms. They also, I didn't get as much chance to talk about this today, to enhance the area's quality of life attributes, to attract the best and the brightest people in America who can live anywhere, to say, I want to live in Houston, and to develop more walkable urban neighborhoods that more and more people in this city are seeking because, of, because they no longer have 3.4 children, but 1.6 children. And, and want more walkability and more opportunities for alternatives to the automobile. So the real question is, will the city be able to translate all this new awareness that these surveys and other evidences are telling us, translate that new awareness into committed and effective, sustained action? It remains to be seen whether the region's business and civic leaders can build on these changes in public attitudes to make the collective investments that will be needed to position Houston for prosperity in a time of economic, demographic, and technological transformation. The world is a different place today than it was 20 and 30 years ago. And the citizens of Harris County and the area residents understand, recognize, and embrace those new realities. To quote the final words in Prophetic City, these are the challenges facing all of America. The jury is out, not only for Houston, but for the rest of the country as well. So I tell people, stay tuned. The world is changing. Houston is the most interesting place in America to, to watch these changes. And thank you all so very much for being here today, for all your support, for your encouragement, for, for, for who we are as Houstonians. I think the greatest strength in the city is the quality of people who are here and who believe in the city and are committed to making the, the city even more successful in the future than it has been in the past. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, my colleague, Ruth Lopez Turley, to talk to you about the tremendous work being done by the Houston Education Research Consortium as a part of the Kinder Institute. I've had the enormous pleasure working with Ruth for, many for more than a decade and watching her remarkable efforts, leading the, the consortiums of, of school districts in the research for HISD and other important school districts in recognizing how critical it is to, to change the trajectory and ensure the success of our students as they go through from, from birth to college, from cradle to career, ready to do the jobs and to lead the way in the 21st century. So let me turn it over to Ruth with great pleasure and gratitude. Thank you again very much. Like many Houstonians, back in February, my family and I experienced a few days without power and water. 
and I was reminded what it feels like to be without basic necessities. It had been many years since I had experienced this, and honestly, I think it was good for me to remember just how difficult everything becomes. Even the smallest things quickly became a hardship. Literally the day before the freeze began, I had prepared remarks for an event in which I was pointing out that one in six HISD families reported having had their utilities turned off during the year, that one in four families sometimes weren't able to pay their rent or mortgage, and that one in four students sometimes experienced hunger for lack of food at home. The next day, those numbers took on a deeper meaning for me. Being without power and water made life a bit more difficult, but I had all kinds of resources to back me up. A pantry full of food and water, a fireplace for warmth, and a neighbor with a generator who threw an extension cord over the fence. Thanks, Dan and Lily. But so many families don't have these resources. As crises continue to highlight inequalities, we must do more to address them, especially those manifested in educational outcomes. HERC has been doing research to inform district leaders' efforts to improve educational equity. We're thrilled that this year, our work has been used to increase access to pre-K, to inform efforts to reduce the negative effects of student mobility, and to raise funds to meet student needs. Currently, the HERC team is collecting data that will help inform efforts to improve student engagement to speed up post-pandemic recovery. But we want to go further. We want to go beyond programmatic efforts to more systemic efforts, not just tweaking programs on the margins, but addressing the underlying systems that generate inequitable educational experiences and result in enormous achievement gaps. In some cases, these gaps are equivalent to three years of schooling. That's unacceptable. What's even more unacceptable is that we know what's causing them. The most important predictor of these gaps is segregation, specifically the racial concentration of poverty in schools. Black and Hispanic students are five times more likely to attend high-poverty schools than white students. Everything is harder in high-poverty schools. It's harder to recruit and retain effective teachers and administrators. English learners take longer to become proficient. And a recent study by Lori Taylor and her team at Texas A&M found that the per-pupil cost of educating a poor student is substantially higher in high-poverty schools. We have to address the underlying systems of inequity that have persisted too long. This is why the Kinder Institute is working to integrate some of our primary research areas, such as education, housing, and transportation, to take on systemic factors. We've been doing great research in each of these areas, but now we need to combine them in order to generate changes in the systems that intersect all these areas. Educational inequities cannot be addressed by school districts alone. We need strong cross-sector efforts led by stakeholders across the community and informed by powerful data and research. We need to coordinate regional efforts with state and federal efforts. And we need to understand that these inequities aren't just harmful to poor Black and Hispanic children. They're harmful to everyone. Several studies have estimated the cost of achievement gaps. The estimates are in the billions of dollars annually. And that's just the economic cost. This doesn't include the social cost of untapped human potential or the moral cost of prolonged injustice. We inherited these systems of inequity from our predecessors, and the time to change them is now. Each year at this event with the Kinder Institute, I have the honor of introducing to you an outstanding Houstonian who, like the Kinder Institute itself, helps build a better Houston. This year, it is my great pleasure to talk about one such Houstonian, and that is Bob Urey. 
Bob is this year's Stephen L. Kleinberg Award honoree, named for my friend of many years. The Kleinberg Award recognizes individuals of extraordinary impact, people who make Houston a place we are proud to call our home. And in our great city, few names have been as synonymous with urban development, design, and vitality as Bob Hury. He has called Houston his home for over 47 years, and he may be one of the single most important forces in the transformation of Houston's downtown. But beyond downtown, he's no stranger to serving the whole of Houston. He's a founding member of the Kinder Institute's advisory board, and he's been a trusted volunteer leader with organizations like Buffalo Bayou Partnership, Discovery Green Conservancy, Fifth Ward CRC, Houston Galveston Area Council, Urban Land Institute, and many, many more. I would be remiss if I didn't also mention he's also a Rice University alum in architecture, and he also helped run the former Rice Center for Community Design and Research. Bob, for all you do and continue to do, I am grateful, and the Institute and our city are grateful as well. It is my sincere pleasure to name you this year's Stephen L. Kleinberg Award honoree. Congratulations, my friend. Good afternoon, and thank you, Mayor, for your kind introduction and for your excellent leadership of our city during this extraordinarily challenging time. Your calm, reassuring words each day are a constant in this period of great uncertainty. To Steve, Rich, and Nancy Kinder and the board, Bill and his team at the Kinder Institute, I am totally thrilled to be this year's recipient of the Kleinberg Award. It is a privilege to stand among previous recipients that I so greatly respect, such as Reverend Bill Lawson last year and the leaders before. I clearly remember the day a decade ago when Nancy Kinder called asking for advice about board members for a new urban research center based on Steve's work at Rice. She was unaware of my past experience at the Rice Center for Community Design and Research four decades earlier. Of course, without a bit of hesitation, I said I would help in any way to make this possible, and I continue to feel this way today. Thanks to all of you for your support. With it, the Kinder Institute is realizing the founding vision of being one of the top urban research centers in the nation starting with Steve's great work with the Kinder Houston Area Survey, the Institute's impact on our community is profound and growing daily. My wife Gail and I feel blessed to have come to Houston 47 years ago for me to continue my education at Rice. As I look back, it is hard to imagine the city we came to compared to our city today. It was much smaller and just beginning its explosive growth to become one of the nation's largest and most diverse metropolises. It cycled through boom and bust, natural disasters and recoveries, and now this pandemic. Houstonians have repeatedly proven that we are a resilient city. Documented in Steve's surveys, our fellow citizens dig in during adversity and work even harder to make this city even better. And there's no greater proof of this than our region's center. 40 years ago, downtown's future was questionable. With enthusiastic support from so many among our citizens, I think we today can all agree that it is indeed becoming the realization of our shared vision of a thriving heart of a great global city. Thank you again for this recognition and for your support of the Kinder Institute and Steve and his work with the Kinder Houston Area Survey. I have always looked forward to his presentations and this year is no exception. Well, congratulations so much to you, Bob. No one deserves that, that award more. No one has made as big a contribution as you have over all these many years to really reframing re downtown and turning it into the exciting, beautiful, uh, welcoming place that it is. And, and, and I've so much admired and, and benefited from our friendship, you and Gail, and for over all of these years. And, and uh, you've honored us by allowing us to honor you. Thanks so much, Bob. Congratulations again. And now I'd like to introduce another of my colleagues at Rice and at the Kinder Institute, Dr. Jennifer Bratter. 
Jennifer's work on the growing complexity of race and ethnicity in the 21st century is a crucial sort of uh, input into understanding where we are as a society and how we are evolving and how we need to change if we're going to be successful as we go forward, especially over these last 14 months when so much has happened to, to aggravate the inequalities that we've known about. Delighted to have her join us at this year's lunch out and to be a part of the Kinder Institute and to remind us of how much exciting, important work is being done across the board at Rice University, addressing these central issues as we all together work to inspire and inform the communities uh, on, on which our research is based and, and who, are, who are the big support of the work of the Kinder Institute. Ladies and gentlemen, Jennifer Bratter. What difference does it make to have versus to have not? We have known for a long time that we all do not occupy the same types of spaces with the same types of resources holding the same level of opportunity. We have known for a long time that differences are stark and have serious consequences for who we are and how we live. And we have known, again, for a long time that the difference that's made can suggest that some lives are valued more than others. This is the reality of inequalities in our society. Differences between groups that yield advantages and access to resources for some groups and barriers to success and opportunities for others. My name is Jennifer Bratter. In addition to being a fellow with the Kinder Institute, I'm a professor of sociology and the founding director of BRIDGE, Rice's new inequality initiative. BRIDGE stands for Building Research on Inequality and Diversity to Grow Equity. This initiative began as an effort to harness the tremendous strengths of Rice in the area of inequality research and generate new information about the patterns, causes, and consequences of living in unequal circumstances. We are fortunate to study these issues while living in Houston, a uniquely diverse city that houses a rich and cosmopolitan environment alongside segregation and separation, concentrated affluence, and poverty. Understanding how inequalities operate in a racially diverse space could not be more important in a time where race matters so clearly. Since the beginning of the pandemic, racial inequality has marked our lives. As COVID-19 ravaged the country, ending the lives of over a half a million Americans, it was also patently clear that its impact was not evenly shared. From the earliest days of the pandemic, we knew that communities of color were dramatically more affected. One year out, we know its toll has actually shortened lives. The CDC estimates of life expectancy reveal a chilling trend, that while on average Americans have lost roughly one year of life due to the death toll of the pandemic, estimated reductions for Black and Latino populations are three to four times that for whites. But this is not the only indicator of how race matters to inequality. Over the past year, the country has been embroiled in a reckoning with social justice, with a particular focus on criminal justice and interactions with the police. In spring and summer of 2020, these calls were inspired by the deaths of George Floyd, Amand Arbery, and Breonna Taylor against a backdrop where Black and Latino groups face higher lifetime risk of being killed by the police compared to whites. In response, the country and the world erupted in protests, with multiracial coalitions here in the United States and across the globe under a banner of Black Lives Matter. This moment took aim at inequalities that have roots not in the individuals who commit the acts, but rather the institutions and systems that manage their behaviors. And why? Because these incidents raise real questions about how such disadvantage continues. Understanding these dynamics requires a reckoning with realities across a range of spheres. Bridges' work answers this call with the understanding that no good research occurs in a vacuum, but rather we need information from a range of disciplines, from sociology to psychology and political science, to history, English, and engineering, with teams that are interdisciplinary, combining social scientists with data scientists, engineers, and humanists. So what have we learned about inequality? First, 
The disadvantage and its consequences come in many forms. Differences in access and opportunity are indexed by space and place, as well as between people in predictable but critical ways. Second, it's critical to understand not only how we are impacted by inequality, but also how we respond to it. Bridge has funded projects that explore how religious communities support at-risk populations, how affordable housing can become a reality in historically disadvantaged areas, and how communities engage the census and voting during the time of the pandemic to ensure that marginalized populations can be counted and have a voice. Finally, today's inequalities have deep roots. The current moment has put a spotlight on conditions that were already there. We've known for a long time that racial inequalities exist in a wide range of areas, from the world of health, education, housing, and criminal justice. But we have yet to truly take seriously how these dynamics are connected, how they operate in concert. And we need to understand the way these issues are baked within our institutions. Racial inequality must be understood as living not solely in people's prejudices against groups, but in systems that disadvantage groups every day. This is an important and critical piece to exploring how inequality operates and represents Bridges' next phase. Because we believe that this approach is our best bet for addressing, minimizing, and even ending these divides to ensure a more equitable world moving forward. Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to continuing this discussion with you after the lunch out via Zoom. Hello, I'm so proud to join you all virtually for the big 4-0, the 40th anniversary of the Houston Area Survey. Throughout all the challenges we've faced as a region, one thing has remained constant, and that is Dr. Kleinberg's study of our region, of its people, and of the impact the decisions government makes have on those who call our region home. We met last year virtually as well, and it was just at the beginning of COVID-19. Now, a year later, we're still in the throes of this virus, but what's very different is we now have a clear path out. We have that light at the end of the tunnel in the shape of vaccines. And so we can begin looking back and celebrating the perseverance, the creativity, the collaboration that has gotten us through the toughest parts of this pandemic. Much of that is thanks to people like you, uh, the folks who have supported us in having a data-driven response to this pandemic a data-driven response to the hurricane that came our way last fall, to the winter storm as soon as we saw what was happening. That's the loudest amidst fire, flood, winter storm pandemic, to focus on proactive work, on smart performance-based budgeting that Harris County hadn't seen before, on a restructuring of our toll road that makes it the highest rating in the country, on a new paradigm on how to deal with homelessness that's already yielding results, a new vision on transportation, thoughtfulness that you all know that can see the big picture, but also recognize the individual impacts to the most vulnerable people in our community, to see that we rise and fall together and that ultimately accountable government helps tear down barriers that folks can't possibly do alone. I want to thank each of you for helping us respond to support the most vulnerable people um, and for helping support the brilliant minds that help us do our job and that keep that this region going, that turned our area from a swamp to an economic powerhouse. And that's people like Bob Yuri, um, whom I know we are honoring today as a creative mind, as a leader, and I also have the, the honor of calling him a fellow marathoner. So Bob, congratulations and thank you for that vision that has led us to where we are today. 
Look, we're going to continue facing challenges, but I know that constant will continue, that constant story of us that Dr. Kleinberg so importantly tells, recognizing that we're not only facing our challenges and dealing with them, but we're also showing the rest of the country what challenges they have to come. Thank you all. Here's to a quick uh, progression from where we are in the pandemic and to next year, us all being able to meet and celebrate in person just as we used to do. Thank you, Judge Hidalgo, for your leadership and service over this past year. As we near the end of today's lunch out, I want to thank you all for welcoming me to the Kinder Institute family in Houston as well. As we begin returning to some sense of normal life, I hope to have the opportunity to meet many of you in the coming months and beyond. On that note, it is my great pleasure to welcome back Bill Fulton. I can think of no better person to ponder how life will be different in Houston and other cities as we emerge from the great challenges of this pandemic. Thank you, Robert. Well, it wouldn't be 2021 without a few thoughts about how Houston and other cities are gonna be different when this pandemic is over. So mull these over as we move forward from today's lunch out. First, big expensive coastal cities like San Francisco and New York are out, while smaller and supposedly cool cities like Austin and Nashville are definitely in. Where does that leave a city like Houston? Big but not expensive and cool in a much more diverse way. How can we take advantage of the opportunities for cities being created by COVID? Second, downtowns and job centers like Houston's Uptown are gonna undergo huge change. They'll become less focused on offices and more focused on meetings and a wide variety of activities. Bob Urey has done a great job stewarding downtown Houston, getting it ready for this next change. But it'll be a challenge not only for downtown, but for all job centers. Third, Bricks and mortar retail stores and regional malls are on the decline. There will be a lot of empty storefronts and empty malls in the next few years, but eventually the gaps will be filled with bars, restaurants, personal care businesses, perhaps co-working spaces, and in some instances, housing as well. So like downtown Houston, your local strip mall will become a place of greater diversity too. Fourth, public transit has been hammered during COVID and it too will morph we'll see greater investment in some lines. For example, Metro Next's ambitious bus rapid transit system and possibly light rail service to Hobby Airport. But we're also likely to see more smaller vehicles and Uber style on-demand transit to fill in the gaps. Arlington, Texas is already experimenting with this. Will Houston? And finally, as some people are untethered from their commutes and decide where to live based on personal preferences, place amenities will matter a lot. Even if they move out of the city, people will still want green space, places to walk and bike, and easy access to destinations. Houston has place amenities in some locations, some neighborhoods, some business districts, lots of parks. But is what we have done so far enough? Or do we have to double down on place amenities to be competitive in the future? Today's lunch out has just about reached its conclusion. And as I mentioned earlier, we want to continue the conversation with you via Zoom Live. Below on your screen are links to three Zoom rooms. You can engage further with Ruth Turley and the Herc team about education, Jennifer Bratter about inequality and equity, or join me, Steve and Robert, about life in Houston after COVID. I'm looking forward to it, and I hope you are too. Well, thank you all so much to all of you for joining us for this year's Lunch Out program. It's, I've missed being with you in person. We've all missed the opportunity to just sort of run into each other and catch up on what's been happening. Uh, but your support and kindness has, has been enormously important to all of us at the Institute and to me especially. I hope next year to be back with you in person for the 2022 Kinder Institute Luncheon. We're planning to, to meet on Tuesday, May 17th, 2022 at the Marriott Marquis in downtown Houston, a chance to get back into our surveys and ask how have we changed one more year in moving in the direction we now think we understand for what will be the future of Houston as we go forward. Uh, until then, take care, stay safe. All our best wishes to you from all of us at the Kinder Institute. And again, thank you so much for your support, your interest, and, and, and the role that each of you is playing in building this wonderful city of ours, positioning it for success in the new world of the 21st century. Thank you all again. See you soon.